Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Missouri District webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about reaching and engaging your community. And our guest is Reverend John Perling, who's the pastor at Faith Lutheran in St. Robert. And he is also the chairperson of our district task force on community engagement. So we're excited to welcome him for this topic. He's been a uh, pastor there. Um, serving both community and the nearby military base um, since 2015, was called there in 2016. So uh, welcome, John. Thank you very much, Peter. It's a pleasure to be with you and with the members and pastors and church workers commissioned and ordained for the uh, Missouri district. We are in, in, in excited about the strategic plan, the strategic plan for the district office and uh, looking forward to uh, engaging all of our critical targets over the course of this triennium and into the future. Uh, in the past triennium, we uh, initiated the plus one program to kickstart uh, opportunities to get, engage with communities on practical levels, as well as the shine service projects. And now we'd like to work towards making those efforts habitual to make them a part of our congregational culture and engaging community is uh, not about just doing a, a one-off event although that can be the chance to highlight such an, uh, a concept if we can engage our communities on a regular basis with ongoing conversation about jesus christ the uh, the gifts of the resurrection which we have celebrated this Easter and uh, the gifts of his presence regularly ongoing in our churches can be a, a benefit to all of our um, members of our community as they get to know Jesus Christ through our, our people and through our, our life together. So I'll be sharing a presentation with you on bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in your neighborhoods. Uh, First of all, with respect to the ongoing challenge, which is very familiar to, to us, uh, the, uh, the Christian church in America in general has found itself growing older, and it has found itself also uh, found itself a little bit more disconnected from the culture around us. We're not uh, blending in as easily as we used to, which is also, we must un, uh, appreciate that this is also an opportunity as well. Uh, while we find ourselves sometimes disconnected from the culture around us, there's a, a real opportunity to highlight the uniqueness of the gospel message and the gifts that our Lord Jesus Christ has for us in the forgiveness of sins, in the church, in eternal life. And so we don't want to uh, maintain the sta status quo. We don't want to uh, blend in with the things that are around us that are contrary to Christ. But we want to take seriously our responsibility and our calling in, in every stage of life and in every vocation of life and in every uh, uh, opportunity that the Lord brings us to, to bring salt and light of our Lord Jesus Christ into uh, into those conversations and into those relationships. One of the things that is going to be primary in our efforts to uh, communicate this to all of us, all of you here in the district, is that outreach and uh, connecting with people, connecting with Christ, is going to primarily happen outside the church walls. It's going to happen primarily in the engagement that we have with other people uh, in other venues. And so our opening video is simply a, a, an invitation to consider what uh, going to make disciples might look like.
every circuit in our district has received a copy of everyone his witness as a evangelism program and a, a chance to uh, engage baptized members of the people of God in the conversations in a variety of ways. Mark Wood, the author of that particular curriculum, has also provided a, a second resource along with CPH and a variety of uh, supplemental resources to go along with that and provides kind of more the, the, the background of how we need to think about moving outside of our church walls and into the lives of people around us. Connected to Christ is a, a very short volume. Um, it's part of a series of four uh, that CPH has put together to provide some help for, for this effort. And it uh, gives a way of thinking about the, the stages of moving a relationship from its beginning into the opportunities for talking about uh, God's gifts for us in Jesus Christ. Initially, we want to think about what a witness is. And we have the formal settings for uh, bearing witness, giving testimony, having a chance to uh, be called to the stand and to say what you know or say what you saw. Um, and there's certainly examples of that that we have uh, in both our, our our formal culture and even in popular culture. But uh, we recognize, too, that the Lord Jesus asked his baptized people to take their experience of his love, their experience of his word, and to communicate that uh, from their hearts and minds through their mouths to share his story. Uh, witnesses throughout the New Testament were uh, enduring and taking risks and engaging people in all types of circumstances. Uh, every time they got into a new town, there was uh, really no way to know what they were going to find until uh, they engaged with people and saw um, how they could take what was around them, what word they knew, what lives they were leading, and bring, bring Jesus' story to them. Luther says, we live on earth only so that we should be a help to other people. And uh, as far as the time that we have available to us, it's, it's leveraged for the sake of our neighbor, uh, both in terms of praying for them, but also in terms of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. We have the gift of knowing that our Lord Jesus has done the full work for us. He has done all the heavy lifting. He has uh, brought to us a completed gift of salvation and not, uh, and not just a, a contract for us to uh, uh, do half our part and he'll do half of, half, half of his part. No, we have a, a gospel message that... Uh, is the truth to share that uh, that there's nothing nothing he has not completed for us we have a we have a, a complete savior the folks that are around us though uh, have only kind of overheard this message uh, we're going to be thinking about what it's like to engage folks in our in neighborhoods and communities. And one of the things that, one of the biblical pictures that comes to mind for me is the, uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that Jesus comes alongside of. They know the whole story. They can share from first to last what Jesus accomplished. They even know that he rose from the dead. Uh, they even tell Jesus as they're walking along. Uh, our women went to the tomb and and they, uh, they saw a vision of angels, and the angels said that uh, he was risen from the dead. But they're sad. They're walking on the road to Emmaus. They know the whole story. They've overheard everything that there is to know about Christianity. But they're still sad. The gospel message has been proclaimed. It just hasn't been proclaimed in a way that they can see that it's for them. Jesus has to come alongside them and take them back through the entire message one more time and connect the dots for them so that they know that this is a gift for them, that they can be 
excited about. And so for many of our people around us, they've overheard the gospel, but they haven't heard the gospel. Well, so where might I share this message? Uh, God is preparing people throughout your life at various stages and in various ways where you can share the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection for them, for the forgiveness of sins and with the promise of eternal life that they can know that there's no longer a, 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 a clock that is ticking them down to their deaths, but that they, from this moment forward, will live forever in the presence of Almighty God. And in that knowledge and in that faith and in that trust, they can have peace and hope for their lives now. Thinking about what we have to offer to folks is uh, oftentimes very humbling. We don't recognize that that we have a message to share or we don't feel like we're qualified. We don't have a, a, a certificate. We don't have a, 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 a notice on our wall that says that we're a fully qualified witness, except for the fact that there you are, a, a baptized child of God. And for many in our congregations, having honestly gone through the, the type of Christian education, confirmation classes, and things like that that we have, you have probably more than you'll ever need as far as uh, equipment and, uh, and resources right there in your scripture and catechism and hymnal to uh, provide the word of the Lord and, uh, and a way to celebrate it that, uh, that most Christians would envy. Our love for other people in the midst of their brokenness is the great motivator. Uh, the fact that our Lord Jesus loves them and the fact that he has uh, given and sacrificed for them and not just for us, that we can begin to uh, engage with the scriptures and begin to read it and digest its message and its its uh, gospel message for ourselves, even as we do with portals of prayer or with whatever other devotional book we might be using or or just to read the scriptures for ourselves, but then to begin to read it for someone else, to begin to ask what their lives are like, what their questions are, and to then begin to read devotionally and to have them in mind as our, as our, on our prayer lists. We'll talk about that in just a little bit too. The framework that we're going to be sharing specifically is uh, this beginning plowing, planting, watering, waiting expectantly, and then harvesting. These are primarily broad scale attitudes and uh, and efforts that will look a little bit different depending on who you are and and who your uh, who your is on your prayer list for this kind of evangelistic work. But we pray that you'll be patient with the various things that that happen to bring a, a full flowering of faith into somebody else's into somebody else's life. What does plowing look like? Well, plowing, preparing the soil, has to do with lifting a person's perspective for in the, in the very first things, just finding them where they are with all the distractions that they have, whether they're engaged with work or, or sports or recreation or other relationships, all the things that are taking their attention, all the things that are taking up the the bandwidth of their lives so that there's mm, no room for spiritual things, no room for uh, considering what's going to happen for eternity, no room for thinking about how my relationships now might be better if I was at peace because of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, how that would change my attitude, how that would make me a, a different kind of person. C.S. Lewis has the example in, in screw tape letters where the first thing that a, a demonic uh, partner wants to do to keep somebody from ever becoming a Christian is to just keep them busy, keep them distracted. 
Keep them from ever thinking about what it would be like to live forever. Keep them from thinking anything about uh, what Jesus' claim on their life might look like and how it might be a, a new birth, a, a, new, a, new, a, a new start for them. But just keep them distracted. If you can keep them thinking about whether or not they're hungry or whether or not they're thirsty or whether or not they have to go here or there or all the things that are on their calendar, all the things they have to prepare for apart from anything more reflective than that. Uh, our distracted busyness is one of the first hurdles. And so just to encourage somebody to take a moment just to slow down, to take a, a stopping point, a resting point where uh, a different kind of conversation can be brought to them. That's uh, that's the first step in plowing, just to help them settle and uh, a chance to stop so that the conversation can even happen. Cultivating that kind of relationship and cultivating a, a sense of space in that relationship can, can happen in a variety of different ways. Um, and so seeing people for as, as objects of Jesus' love this is going to be our first stop, recognizing that they are, are lost and that God has put them into our lives through the various networks that he has created for us to pray for them and to understand how their lives are bound to ours, to learn to listen to their story and then to, uh, to keep their story in mind as we're doing our own devotions and our own Bible reading so that the Holy Spirit can uh, can work with that and those memories of listening to their story, listening to their hurts, in order to uh, bring a word, to formulate a word by the word that will be uh, significant for them. We encourage you to, to think about the people in your life who don't know Jesus with respect to uh, who they are and how we can pray for them, uh, making an actual list and uh, putting them in a place where you'll see it. Uh, the old the old sticky note next to the uh, bathroom mirror sure may work for you still. Uh, it may also work to have a, a list on your phone or have a list uh, that's on a, in a day planner or a diary if that's something you still use. But then to pray for them and to pray that the Lord will work through the word as you experience it, also with them in mind. This is this is what uh, pastors and, and church workers are, are trying to do all the time when we're preparing sermons and Bible studies. What's going to be helpful for the people that are hearing me? And we want to encourage you as people working throughout the world in uh, in various venues of life, to have that list of people, kind of think about your own mini congregation that that the Lord has bound you to and connected you to, connected you to with your various callings, that in your devotion life, in your prayer life, that uh, that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to you, this word is is for you, but it's also for for this neighbor. Luke 10, verse 2 reads, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus' word there wasn't just theoretical. <laughs> as soon as he asked his disciples to pray that prayer, you know what happened next? He picked 12 disciples. <laughs> he said, you guys are the answer to this prayer. You're going to come alongside me, and we're going to do this work together. Uh, we'd encourage you to uh, to pray regularly for the people that you uh, recognize are without Christ and without his promises and without his uh, comforts. And to pray for them, perhaps even at, at 10.02, in recognition of this scripture passage, Luke 10, verse 2. A turtle doesn't get on a post because he crawled there. A turtle gets on a post because someone put him there. And this is simply an image to help us realize that our witnessing opportunities don't come by accident. When you're in church on Sunday, listening to the sermon or uh, attending Bible class, the Lord also knows 
who you're going to be in touch with on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday. That word that your pastor is bringing to you, that word that you're reading in your scripture study at home, all of those are part of the mix of what the Lord knows about not just you, but about your future and the uh, and the interactions, the networks of people that he's going to bring you to. So keep your eyes open for those moments where the Lord interrupts the flow of your life with a person who needs to know about his son, Jesus Christ. Put their name on your list and pray for them and recognize that there's an opportunity to learn more about their lives, to listen to them deeply, so that then the word that you read and the word that you hear can become an effective resource for bringing Christ to them. Having begun, having plowed up, uh, having gotten hold of a, a list of names, having considered and listen to them and what their lives are like, we begin to connect their story with Jesus' story. As they share about their hurts, as they share about the ways that sin breaks in on them and, and the brokenness of the world causes them pain, their own disappointments in life, as they share how the law is crushing them and how they can find and see that the the false gods that they're holding on to the the things that they're relying on don't cut the mustard they don't support the weight of their lives and so they're hmm, dissatisfied with the gods of the world they're dissatisfied of the options that they feel they've been given as far as what to rely on what to trust in what to hope for and so the law is doing its work and recognize it for what it is. It is the law of God that is showing them that their life doesn't work. It's not, uh, it's not bearing the weight of the complexity of all that they are experiencing. The law is doing its work. So it's not just then about commiserating, right? It's not just about saying, yeah, boy, things really are rough out there. Yeah, boy, it seems like you're having a tough day. Uh, it's not just that. It's actually the law of God doing its work in preparation for a word of gospel. And so as we hear that, we need to stop hearing it as complaining. And we have to hear it as the Lord's signal that it's time to share the gospel with this person. Because the law is already doing its work. So rather than just shaking our heads and saying, boy, they don't like their lives. Boy, what a downer that was. Here's our moment. Here's what we've all been waiting for. This is the moment where we have the chance to say, guess what? I have another way of thinking about this, and that is that the weight of your life can be borne by the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. All the things that you have been relying on, all the things that you thought would make your life work, yeah, they haven't worked, have they? But guess what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ provides a different story, a different way to think about your life and a th different way to think about how the creator of the universe loves you and has done so in a very specific way. And now, now he would call you by this promise, by his Holy Spirit, to come know, love, trust, and follow him. So as people share their lives and share their hurts, it's not just about sharing uh, that they're uh, Debbie Downers or, or Donnie Downers. It's that they're sharing with you that the law of God is crushing the false gods in their lives and that they need a new one. They need a new God. They need Jesus. Planting seeds turns then to watering and to caring for, nurturing. This is this is small p uh, pastoral care. This is small d discipleship. This is a matter of, of encouraging and coaxing that new planting into a, uh, a, a, a living organism, a living faith. So watering and caretaking go very much together. Take good care of the planted seed by providing what it needs to grow. 
So is that first opportunities for witness keep that relationship strong and keep it alive, consider all the other ways that your life is connected with that person, considering the other rest of the, the context of that relationship. What responses have they had? What, what uh, questions do they have? What opportunities are available for, for growing that faith, putting them into contact with other Christians who have a, 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 a like experience, right? We're not interested in a, a bait and switch kind of invitation. What we're interested in is growing them up authentically and organically within the community of the people of God. So as your first invitation and your first declaration of the promises of God uh, soaks in, it can be added to with further uh, opportunities. So did you give some thought to what I had to say? How is it going for you now? What questions do you still have? What are the appropriate things that engage their mind, their, their cognitive faculties, or their affective faculties, their heart? And what opportunities for service open up for them as they consider what it would be to live a, a generous life, right? What behavioral changes might there mean? What might it mean as far as recognizing sin in their life and things that they might become aware of that, honestly, they had grown so used to that it's a surprise to find that the Holy Spirit is working to say, hey, maybe maybe that's not something that I want to continue in. And maybe there's new things that I need to embrace. As we water, we wait expectantly. God is working. The Holy Spirit has promised that he will accompany his word and that it won't go uh, without, without, uh, without uh, fruit. And so instead of being impatient, instead of jumping the gun, waiting, in patient, uh, waiting patiently uh, allows for that word of the Lord and their experience perhaps with a few new Christians, a few new relationships to begin to percolate to let them grow into this thinking about what it means. Uh, we're, we're not necessarily imagining that uh, this is going to be a one-stop shop conversation, that this is going to be kind of drive-by witnessing. No, no, no. This is all about being a part of people's lives and a part of relationship because we're talking about our communities, people we, we live with, interact with, and, uh, and share life with across the board in our, our schools and our workplaces and in the lives of our of our neighborhoods. And we are not the ones that uh, make Christians happen. We share the story, we share what Christ has done, we share the promises. Uh, God is going to be the one who is in charge of all of the timing of how that percolating bears fruit. And so we continue to encourage, we and continue to answer questions, we continue to invite, we continue to uh, bring them into partnership with other Christians that are uh, of have similar interests and have similar hobbies and that they can share time with, but uh, but never as a matter of manipulation, always as, as a matter of of waiting on the Lord for his purposes to be fulfilled. As we wait, we also wait urgently because we know that there comes a day when the Lord will announce his verdict, that uh, all things have come to their completion. Our waiting ultimately and eventually, we pray, will turn into harvesting, just as the Lord Jesus promised. The Lord gave his disciples the work of of harvesting as the uh, the community of of the Samaritan woman and was uh, coming over the ridge and he pointed out to them look at the look at all the work that this woman has done to bring her entire village to come and see and 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 meet me and to share time with me look at uh, how ready the harvest is so don't grow weary 
even though we are surrounded by bottom lines and people looking for bottom lines all the time, we are a part of a of the process of being in the world, but not of the world, as we bring the gospel to the world. There are going to be times when we have disappointments, but there are going to be times when we have opportunities to rejoice that God has made a change with a person in their heart and mind when they realized that the false gods that they were depending on were simply not sufficient for their life. And they have come to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides them everything they need to support this body, this life for the long term and forever. This is the calling that God has for them and it's the calling to come alongside them that we have as baptized Christians in the church and with his people. So keeping our role clear and being very clear about the Holy Spirit's role in this is very important. We know Christ and we make Christ known. But we do not have the power to change anyone's heart, nor do we have the calling to try to argue them into the kingdom of God. We have a truth. We have a testimony. We have been with Jesus through his baptism and through his ministry and through his death and resurrection. And he now lives and reigns to all eternity from the right hand of his father's throne. He is active and working. He is the one who is calling disciples, follow me. And he does that through our testimony and through our words. But we are not the ones that can either manipulate people into faith or, uh, or change their hearts. That is the power of the word of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. He calls, he gathers, he enlightens, he sanctifies. He keeps people in the faith. And so we pray that through that word that he's put in our hearts, that he can take the preached word we have on Sunday and uh, make it percolate with us so that we can put it into our own words and, uh, and share it with neighbor, friend, co-worker, and all the places where the Lord sends us. If our congregations depend solely on their employed church workers to do all of the evangelistic work, all of the faith sharing for the church, then we will be doing 120th or 140th or 100th or even 1 250th of the amount of work that the church as a whole is being called to do. And no one person can do the work of connecting Jesus with the network of everyone else in their congregation. We all need to be a part of this. We all need to recognize that we are unique in those relationships. Uh, as, a, as a pastor in the community, I work to make relationships happen with people outside of my church regularly. So I'm also practicing this in the cafes and in the workshops and in the places where people gather for breakfast or lunch or at their workplaces and in the community at, uh, at uh, football games or soccer games that they can know that they have a, a, a place of a relationship with Jesus Christ, that they can know that they have a witness that's ready to share. And people will ask all kinds of questions in all kinds of circumstances. Our schools are a, a huge resource in this regard as well. While I was vicaring, I uh, got a call from a woman who... Uh, whose kids went into our school and they, uh, they, uh, they attended school there and they kept coming home, kept coming home saying, we want to get baptized. And so she called the church office and said, so how do I get my kids baptized? <laughs> what do I need to do? She said, what do I need to do to get my children baptized? And so we uh, set up a time to talk about that. And we, walk through scripture, we walk through the life of faith, and uh, she read John 3, 16 for the very first time in her life during those conversations. And she looked at me, and she looked at the Bible, and she looked at the, 
at our study guide and she looked back at me and she looked back at the Bible and she looked back at me and she said, so it's just faith for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's just faith. And I said, you betcha. That's right. That's how it works. She was all ready to try to figure out what our church had as the top 10 things that she needed to do to get baptized, even to the point of saying, how much are you going to give, or how much are you going to volunteer, or how much are you going to do this, how much are you going to do that? Top 10 things. And there weren't any top 10 things. It was just faith. It was to see Jesus and to know him as Savior to recognize that the work of the Lord had already been done for her and was now being done with her. And so she relaxed, she leaned back in her chair, and she said, well, that's easy. <laughs> on the one hand, yes, it's very easy. On the other hand, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your whole life, to know that Everything else is falling away, but Jesus Christ is lifting you up. Well, we've presented this as a process of preparing the soil, planting the seed, watering and waiting expectantly, and ultimately, yes, harvesting. Rarely do all of these things happen in a quick succession. They're like stages that bounce around sometimes. Sometimes a person who certainly comes to faith has challenges again. And when they come to faith, you can bet that the enemy would love to have them back. And so being baptized and coming to faith and participating in the life of the church is, uh, is something that the devil is very jealous of. And he's going to have a, a, a big target on the back of their backs as well as he puts, uh, puts obstacles in their way. And it's likely that the Lord will bring and will have to bring a lot of other people into those uh, people's lives so that they can know uh, the fullness of uh, what God's gifts to his church are, the many gifts and talents that other people have as well as we connect them to one another. So don't get discouraged if, uh, if God is not working directly on your schedule, your timetable. As we move through our lives, we'll keep carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ with us as we go. Along with connecting to Christ and the series that the, the Lutheran Church has put out with the, with the evangelism board for uh, everyone, his witness, which we encourage in the district through our circuits and so forth, we pray that you'll also get equipped for conversations in various ways and in various uh, ways that you can connect with people uh, both online or in your neighborhoods and to recognize that the Lord has uh, lots of ways of bringing our word into the lives of other people. Thank you, Pastor Perling, for excellent presentation about how God works through us. Uh, what our role is, what the Holy Spirit's role is, um, and uh, and for sharing that. I do not believe that there were any questions, um, but if anyone does have a question, you can put it into the Q&A box, and we can answer that before we close out for today. Seeing none, thank you again for the presentation and uh, and for the good work that you're doing and sharing your heart as you shared this presentation. Peace be with you, Peter.